Hey, today's lecture is going to be on chest pain. This is a focused approach for the USMLE Step 2 examination. My name is Dr. Ahmed Zafrin, and uh, we're going to be talking about chest pain today. So one of the most common complaints at emergency departments and doctor's offices across the world is actually of chest pain. And what we want to know when we are assessing chest pain um, is, is it life-threatening? See, when you have a chief complaint like chest pain, um, what you have is you need to think about the history of the presenting illness and ask yourself a series of questions regarding that complaint. And one of the best ways to do that is to, through the mnemonic Old Cart. So what does Old Cart mean? The onset. So when did the uh, chief complaint begin? The location. Ask, you would need to ask the patient exactly where that pain um, is presenting. And in this particular case, this is chest pain. But you also need to know the duration. When did this pain start? Um, and how long has it lasted? The character. So describe the pain. What is the pain like? Is it a sharp pain? Is it a dull pain? Is it something that they've never felt before? Does it feel like an elephant is sitting on top of their chest? <coughs> Excuse me. What aggravates the pain? So if the patient sits up, sits down, moves around, sits still, something typically will aggravate the pain. What relieves the pain? Same kind of things. If the patient is sitting up versus sitting down, um, Sometimes you'll have relieving factors that will help you understand what uh, the underlying cause of the, tr of the uh, chief complaint is. And in this case, we're talking about chest pain. And treatment. Have they treated themselves? Have they taken aspirin, any other medications, uh, herbal treatments? A lot of times, people, when they have chest pain, they'll try to take antacids. Um, if they're on previous medications that might help with pain, uh, they may have taken that as well. A good mnemonic for this, as we mentioned, is old cart. It's easy to remember. So again, onset, location, duration, character, what aggravates the pain, what relieves the pain, and if they've uh, done anything to treat the pain. You also want to think about um, other uh, factors such as age, uh, risk factors such as smoking, diabetes, high cholesterol, particularly uh, the bad cholesterol, quote unquote, which is LDL, and patients who have underlying hypertension. If the patient has uh, any combination of these comorbidities or all of them, then you need to think that the patient may be having a myocardial infarction until proven otherwise. So the physical examination is important after doing uh, a history. And in the, in the physical examination, you want to look at the patient and get a general understanding of what their appearance is. Are they sweating profusely, which means they're diaphoretic? Are they breathing rapidly uh, or tachypnic? Are they anxious? The physical examination will also include inspecting the chest wall, since that's the source of or the location of the pain that they're having. Are they using accessory muscles for breathing? Are they having chest retractions? You also want to make sure that you listen to the patient. Are they having any abnormal heart sounds? You know, do they have any abnormal breath sounds? The physical examination coinciding with the history, history will give you a, a big picture and a general understanding of what's going on with the patient and their underlying problem. You also want to feel and see if the patient has pulses, um, as you'll see later on when we talk about differential diagnoses, um, if they don't have pulses, it might indicate that the patient might have an aortic dissection. Do they have calf tenderness? Um, patients who have deep venous thromboses can actually lead to a pulmonary embolism, um, which can also mimic or lead to chest pain. Uh, do they have edema in their legs? So you want to evaluate the extremities and do pinpoint examination in addition to your history. When you're looking at um, the causes of, of chest pain, there are certain tests that you need to do in order to help figure out the puzzle pieces um, and understand what the underlying condition is. 
what you're going to look at is an EKG, a 12 lead EKG. Um, there are uh, blood markers such as the CKMB, specifically MB1, which is specific for cardiac tissue, MB2, which is found in the plasma, troponins T and I, which we'll discuss, and chest x-rays. These are all tests essential and vital when working up a patient with chest pain. So looking at an EKG, you need to understand that an EKG, a 12-lead EKG, is the single most important test in evaluation of chest pain. Approximately 50% of patients who have an acute myocardial infarction actually have EKG changes consistent with uh, a ST elevation or Q waves. You, got, you should also note that many non-cardiac related conditions also have EKG changes, and that further emphasizes the importance of an EKG for all patients being evaluated for significant chest pain. Chest pain with a normal EKG also signifies a very minimal chance that the patient is having an acute MI. Uh, this is important so when you're doing your differential diagnosis, thinking about the different types of uh, underlying conditions that can cause chest pain, a patient with an EKG that's normal um, makes you feel or, or gives precedent that the patient is not likely having an acute myocardial infarction. What we'll often see in patients having a uh, myocardial infarction is flipped or flattened T waves, uh, ST elevation or Q waves, but sometimes, sometimes you won't see any changes on the EKG and given their other comorbidities, uh, you have to do other tests which will indicate that the patient is actually having a non-ST elevated myocardial infarction. And that leads to another test or other tests um, that are cardiac markers. So the cardiac markers uh, that we're going to talk about are specific and sensitive for the cardiac tissue. And that includes the CKMB, which was mentioned previously, and the troponin levels. And what you'll find in this chart is that if you have if you order a CKMB and a troponin level, and the CKMB is normal, yet the troponin level is elevated, what you might have is a micro or a minor infarction. But if you have both labs that are elevated, a CKMB that's elevated and a troponin level that's elevated, then you should be highly suspicious um, and believe that the patient is having an acute myocardial infarction. So let's talk a little bit more about the troponins. The cardiac troponins um, are defined as the troponin T, but this is also elevated in renal disease, polymyositis, and dermatomyositis. So you need to make sure that you do a, a thorough history and physical examination, or if the test uh, question mentions that the patient has polymyositis or dermatomyositis, then that might not be the best test uh, to to draw for this particular patient might be better to do a troponin I. Uh, they're both similar in sensitivity and specificity and are preferred markers for diagnosis of myocardial injury. So when do you want to do these tests? Well you want to draw these blood tests as soon as the patient is in the emergency room and you're suspicious for a myocardial infarction. And they should be done serially about 6 to 12 hours um, and about three times to rule out an acute myocardial infarction. Troponins um, are typically elevated approximately two weeks after the symptoms are initiated. So as soon as they have the symptoms, the troponin levels will be up for two weeks, which makes them useful for late markers of a recent acute myocardial infarction. Keep in mind also that a normal troponin with a normal EKG typically means very low risk of a major cardiac event uh, over the next 30 days to two months. What is the CKMB? So the CKMB can be found in two different components, the MB1, which is found in plasma, and the MB2, which is found in cardiac muscle. The CKMB is less often used than troponins. They are detectable in serum approximately four to six hours after the onset of ischemia. They peak around 12 to 24 hours, and they normalize after about two to three days. Again, similarly to the troponins, you want to start this blood sample um, in the ER 
They'll be done every 6 to 12 hours and three times. So now that we've talked about the history, the physical, the different type of, of lab tests that you would need to do in the assessment and evaluation of chest pain, let's talk a little bit about the differential diagnosis. What are the different types of underlying conditions that can result in the symptoms consistent with chest pain? So what we've done here is I've broken down the different types of diseases under three components. One is cardiac. The second is pulmonary, and I've labeled the third as non-cardiac. This setting needs to be understood, taking into account the cofactors that we mentioned previously. In this case, we're going to separate our diagnoses into these three categories. So let's look at cardiac. Acute coronary syndromes. So acute coronary syndromes are cases that actually lead to a myocardial infarction where you have atherosclerosis of the vessels nourishing, bringing oxygen to the heart muscle itself. And these patients will present with crushing, severe pain, often radiating to the jaw, the arm, or even the shoulder. They typically last more than 20 to 30 minutes in duration. They're not relieved by nitroglycerin pills, and as opposed to angina, which is typically relieved by nitroglycerin. So when you're looking at these different uh, differential diagnoses, you want to think about the history and physical examination that was discussed prior and be able to elucidate the differences between each one. Stable angina uh, was also mentioned, which I, which I mentioned previously in conjunction with ACS. It's different than um, a patient who's having a myocardial infarction because typically angina will be relieved by nitroglycerin. Aortic stenosis is a valvular uh, disease characterized by a systolic murmur. Oftentimes, patients have a bicuspid valve um, that calcifies over years and it's found in old age. Um, so you need to think about aortic stenosis as one of the potentials um, of patients who have chest pain. Myocarditis. So myocarditis uh, typically presents as a mild to make, uh, vague pain often preceded by a viral illness and what you'll often what you'll sometimes see are conduction abnormalities on your EKG. Pericarditis. So pericarditis is uh, characterized by a sharp pain and it's often relieved by a patient sitting up. So when you're doing questions for the USMLE Step 2 and they talk about a patient having chest pain, sharp pain that's relieved by sitting up, uh, you want to think pericarditis. Pericarditis also on the EKG will, will have diffuse changes, nonspecific diffuse changes. Aortic dissection. Aortic dissection is typically characterized by a sharp, unbearable pain that radiates to the back. Um, on physical examination, you'll find that the patient may have loss of pulses, and sometimes the patient, due to the aortic dissection, will result in aortic insufficiency. On the chest x-ray you can see mediastinal widening and it's typically confirmed either by an MRI, a CT scan, or a TEE, which is a transesophageal echocardiogram. Mitral valve prolapse. Well mitral valve prolapse is interesting in that it's a transient pain. It's characterized, and remember this, quote-unquote, by a mid-systolic click Oftentimes the, the question will have a clue like that in it. And it prevent, presents in young females who oftentimes don't have any other risk factors. So that, that concludes the cardiac uh, differentials. Obviously there, are, there could be many more differential diagnoses, but these are the most important ones uh, to think about when you're evaluating chest pain uh, through the cardiac tract. So for pulmonary, the first thing I'm going to talk about is pulmonary hypertension. So pulmonary hypertension, the symptoms and signs are typically of patients who have right heart failure. They'll have shortness of breath, pulmonary congestion. Typically, uh, these patients will have a echocardiogram to assess the heart function um, and the anatomy. Pneumothorax can also present as chest pain. 
typically on chest x-ray, one side of the lung will be whited out, meaning you won't be able to see uh, any specific uh, air inside the lung. Uh, when you listen to the patient's uh, breath sounds, you'll find that on, on the side of the pneumothorax, you won't be able to hear any breath sounds. Uh, it's typically presenting as sudden pain, dyspnea, uh, no breath sounds, as I mentioned, on the side of the injury, and this could be spontaneous. Some patients are young, they have a spontaneous pneumothorax, they have shortness of breath, and they are hospitalized as a result. Uh, it could also result from blunt trauma as well. Pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary embolism when, when you look at the stem of the question and they're discussing the patient's chest pain, they're often found to be tachypnic, breathing rapidly, dyspneic, uh, having difficulty breathing. They have a cough, pain on inspiration. It could lead to sudden death. Uh, and and I, as I mentioned previously on the examination, when you examine the, the legs, patients who have deep venous thromboses, those clots can, can actually be dislodged and go to the lungs, leading to a pulmonary embolism. Uh, on alter, arterial blood gases, they are hypoxemic. And EKG oftentimes will show nonspecific changes, in, in particular S wave in uh, lead 1, Q waves on lead 3, and T waves also on lead 3. And this is typically diagnosed by a spiral CT, uh, CT scan, Sometimes you can do a VQ scan, which is a ventilation perfusion scan, or a pulmonary angiogram. So the non-cardiac causes of chest pain, when we're thinking about our differential diagnoses, include costochondritis. And costochondritis is really important because it's a musculoskeletal cause of chest pain. And musculoskeletal causes of chest pain are actually the most common causes of chest pain. They're characterized by inspiratory pain, so pain when you take in a deep breath. They can be reproduced by palpation, which is significantly different than patients who present with myocardial infarction. You can actually take a finger and push down on that spot and reproduce the pain. And you don't have any EKG changes with costochondritis. Hiatal hernia. Uh, hiatal hernia is characterized by uh, acid reflux after eating that typically is uh, improved with antacids. GERD is gastroesophageal reflux disease and that kind of and similarly to hiatal hernia uh, GERD is is treated with antacids, PPIs which are proton pump inhibitors to decrease the acid in the stomach um, and that can also be perceived and, and have the symptoms of, of non-cardiac chest pain. Peptic ulcer disease, patients typically come in uh, complaining of epigastric pain that's worse uh, after a few hours after eating. Gallbladder disease, patients often will come in presenting with right upper quadrant pain, sometimes with referred pain going up to the right shoulder. And esophageal spasms, Esophageal spasms can mimic chest pain and be induced by cold liquids. They're oftentimes, oftentimes they can be relieved by uh, nitroglycerin pills. And they present similarly to angina. Um, to diagnose it, uh, often a gastroenterologist will use esophageal manometry to assess if the patient has esophageal spasms. So what are the take-home points for this lecture? Well, first and foremost, know that chest pain has multiple causes. And it's essential to do an extensive history and physical examination to understand what the chief complaint is, to go through your old CART, which is a way to understand the onset, the location, the duration, uh, the characteristics, the, what aggravates the, the pain, um, what relieves the pain, and what kind of treatments the patient has used. And that gives you a better understanding of, of what's the underlying cause. You want to know what kind of lab tests are essential, um, and you want to know your differential diagnoses. The broader that you think, the, more, the less likely you're going to miss a diagnosis. And ultimately, if you know your differential diagnoses, you're going to get the right answer on the test because you'll be able to distinguish and differentiate from the multiple causes of chest pain. 
I hope this lecture was beneficial for you, uh, and thank you very much for your time.